The Celtics looked dominant. The Lakers struggled. Shout out to James Harden for showing up to work in pajamas. And the Warriors look like they're ready to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. All right, guys. Good morning. And I just want to shout out right now. So we've got Shams. we got Eddie. We do have a special guest today because Chandler is on his honeymoon. I mean, he just timed that imperfectly, did he not? But we have 10-year NBA vet Evan Turner with us today. Evan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you all. Thank you. So we, also, I'm, I'm excited. Celtics assistant coach. Oh, also, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did that one year, and I was like, "I'm straight, bro." This is never, like, never again. <laughs> yeah, I might as well. I might as well go get a paper route. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Coaching life not for you. Good to know. Good to know. Well, we're happy because yeah. the season finally kicked off last night, and it was everything we wanted it to be. But we also want to. There were some debuts. There were debuts made, and this gives us a good excuse to run some Evan Turner vintage footage from your first game, which unfortunately mm. came against a hot Miami Heat team with just the best names in the sport at the time. But what do you remember? Man, I remember, uh, I remember it was actually my 22nd birthday. So that was pretty Ooh. cool. And then uh, I remember checking into the game and um, my coach giving defensive assignments. And I remember hearing him say like, Drew, you got Wade, such and such. You have this guy and Evan, you got LeBron. And I remember being like, huh? <laughs> like I'm not even warmed up yet. And that was that was pretty much it. I remember, you know, my first debut seeing the highest level of basketball from some of the, you know, best players in the world at the time and some of the best players the game has ever seen. It was definitely a, a great moment and a, a hell of a debut to, you know, have that memory to recall upon. Might as well get thrown in the fire on your first game and everything's downhill from there. So we did have some good game. We had some fun last night. Celtic Sixers was the first game on the docket. And it started with, there was some fashion across the board and you guys will learn this about me. I'm obsessed with the walk-in fashion catwalks. Um, the Harden pregame outfit. Eddie, you liked it. Is that right? Oh, like, <laughs> oh, I love, I loved it. Like the I more I thought about it, when I saw the slippers, the bag, like this is me, cozy vibes all times. Yeah. <laughs> It looks so warm and I don't know. I don't know if it's that cold yet. I have no idea what the East Coast looks like right now, but is there anything that these guys won't wear at this point? Because I feel like we're, we're seeing it all in the NBA. No, definitely. You, you got to think everybody wears the same thing, you know? So when you do the trendy, you damn near have to jump out the window just to kind of <laughs> get a, get a new vibe or, you know, kind of, you know, set a new trend. So I thought what James Harden was rocking was super cozy. I knew he had a good flight home, probably, you know, and he, he, probably, he probably woke up this morning with it on, too. <laughs> oh, it's I live Look, in pajamas, so I love it. <laughs> when I tell you how much that outfit cost, it will it didn't make no sense to me. So yeah. shout out What's to it? James for Wait, shelling what? over three thousand dollars for that. Wait, who what what designer is it? I didn't even bother. I, I with forget. I, I, I follow the page. It's I follow the page. It was it, uh, the the sweater was this page called Pro Trending. They gave us all the prices. The slippers, thirteen hundred dollars slippers, most expensive thing you had on. Wow. I don't know. I don't know what kind of life I'd have to live to have thirteen hundred dollars slippers. A good but one. More power really? to James. <laughs> Oh, really? By the way, I could do an entire hour on the fashion show and, and other things that are coming up, but we do we do need to get to the game. And Tatum and Brown, 35 points apiece. Paul Pierce saying they're the best duo in the game. And my question is quite simple. We can start with you, Evan. Are they? Anytime you can get two guys to combine for 70 points versus a team like the 76ers, I was thinking last night, like, these dudes aren't stopping. They were just scoring at will, scoring at, at will. So right now, I, I see it. I definitely see it. And and if it's not now, in the next year or two, for sure, it's not. it, it won't even be close. These two are dominant and they're playing at a high level. And, and I think the mixture, Tatum's, he's giving to you consistently, he's giving it to you smoothly. And then you get a Jalen Brown that's going to go get 30 every single night at a high level. Like he's very, very dominant players. Two tough matchups. Hey, yeah, I, I want to ask, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just saying their ability to play on both ends as well. You know, they're they're active on defense. And I think there's a lot of credit to Jalen. A lot of these actions aren't made for him on offense. He's getting a lot of secondary offense. He's getting a lot of creating late in the clock, and he's still making it work. They're up there. I mean, you could say somebody like Giannis and Chris Middleton. You could say their opponents yesterday. You could say Kevin and Kai. But 
you know, those guys are 23 and 24 and <laughs> they just went to the finals. Like they have to be up there. They're high on the list. Paul Pierce, very biased in this, by the way. Let's just say that. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> biased, but, but Eddie, at the same time, they might be very biased, but Jalen Brown doesn't ever get the credit he deserves. So we sit yeah. here and say, like, to bring up Chris Middleton, I'll give that credit because Chris Middleton is a great champ. He's a champion. And he carried him down a stretch of the championship. But what I'm saying, in that situation, we never give Jalen Brown the, the credit he deserves. He's unbelievable on open court. He's a tough shot maker. His mentality is crazy. And he literally helps set the tone and set, shifts the energy in every situation. Think about how many times he comes in an open court transition and just turns a one-on-two into an and one like literally every damn near every play, it almost looks selfish. It's just a skill. He um, has no my, conscience on offense. I love it. <laughs> Evan, you 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 were with them just two years ago, so you you saw them up close and personal. But I feel like where they've come, even from two years ago when you were there to now, I mean, you could say easily on on some nights it could be Jalen's show. The other night it could be Jason's show. We saw in the NBA Finals when Jason struggled, it was Jalen Brown that was really bringing the performance at a high level. So I think. What they've been able to do, kind of putting ego to his side, putting any type of, um, you know, of, of that, you know, off-court matter as far as who's better. I think they've done a great job of that, and they've found the balance. Mm-hmm. But, Evan, when you were there two years ago versus what, what you see now, I mean, how much do you think they've grown as, as people? I think they've grown. I think uh, one thing that's occurred is uh, their maturity and leadership has definitely uh, stepped up. Um, they've always been great kids, but, you know, one thing about great players that really shows that your team is either – you know, you're going to step up and take assertiveness for the group or you're just going to be an individual player. You can see that they're taking uh, assertiveness and accountability for the whole, not only the team, but the whole organization. And uh, that's shining through and through. And I think the future and the season is bright in Boston, regardless of uh, all the distractions and stuff. Something that's weirdly underrated. Go ahead, yeah. I was just say, something that's weirdly underrated with those guys is they've been playing big games since they got to the league. They were playing game yeah. sevens with LeBron. They they were doing all that. So they're strangely really battle tested and yeah. they're poised because of that. Even talking to Jason over the summer, it's like you could see his focus on, okay, he got there, he lost. He didn't like that feeling. And how do we get back? How do we get back and we'd be better? Um, you know, those guys, those guys have been through it all now. Now, that, now they all have to do is just win it, I guess. But again, that won't be easy. Uh, I just want to say this as a person who's terrified of public speaking, uh, watching Jalen Brown before the game, give his part on Bill Russell. And they had that moving tribute. I was just like in awe. Cause to me, that's, uh, that's hell on earth is getting up there with a microphone in front of all those people. So I just want to say that right now, um, James Harden, of course, was also on the court and there were moments when he showed his true greatness. Um, don't worry. It wasn't all the moments like that. He did it. But is dominant James Harden back? Because that's what we're all looking for, right, Evan? Yes, yes. I think so. I think um, his energy, I think he's healthy. I think his whole vibe last night was was really towards trying to win and, you know, everything he said this summer. I think his whole offseason, he's been on a mission to try to, you know, get back to that level and prove that he's uh, – you know, one of the best offensive players to ever play the game. And last night in the first half, he was unbelievable. He's varying his offense more than he has in the last few years. He's doing floaters, mid-range pull-ups. He looks like 2013 James, who was one of the more interesting and best players in the league. Uh, he's clearly motivated. He's in better shape. I, I can't wait to see him do this for a full season. He had a great game last night. Like, you can't understate it. 35 points, shot it from all over the place big and ones. Uh, he, he looked like James. They're happy to have him back. He, he did I, I, look like James. M- my Go sense ahead, in Shenong. Philly, though, it, Michelle, is that <laughs> they've got to they, they've got to figure out offensively from a, from a structure of Joel, James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris. I mean, there are moments where Tobias Harris, you could you could just see the body language. He wanted the ball at different points. There were moments this summer where. Uh, you know, I think Tobias Harris probably questioned his role at times. Am I, you know, cause he came into Philly as the two, three. Now he's on some nights, the fourth option. So in Philly, I think the biggest thing will be Docker is figuring out roles for this team. But James, you think, you know, with um, Tobias Harris being a fourth option, you think that's a sign of depth? You know, if you really want to be a championship team to have Tobias Harris as your fourth option, as you've seen, I guess, technically having uh, Andrew Wiggins as your fourth option. You know what I'm saying? That's a dangerous fourth option. So I think one thing that Brad Stevens always said was know your role, star your role, accept your role. And I think a Tobias Harris at a fourth option could be an easy 18 and 10. 
No. I, I, I love oh, Tobias Harris as a fourth option. Um, you know, I think I think for the, for Philly though, this is a semi new team. I know this team played second half together, but right now they've got to embrace their roles, and all the guys have to embrace that. Eddie, this one's for you because on the text thread last night, it was mandatory that we get this in the show. So you're welcome. <laughs> you want to dry, You want to take us through this beauty? <laughs> Yo, this, I do stuff like this when I hoop at the Sunday Wash Club. Like I might have a great move and then just airball. This blew my mind. <laughs> Also, <laughs> when you have Marcus Smart and James Harden running into each other, there's no telling how far they're going to fly in each direction. So <laughs> that's kind of the most impressive part of the play to me. Like, look, look at, at how that. far Marcus Smart went. He went to the baseline. That's nuts. Wow. Um, this was this this was really my James's back moment. Like, he stopped. He waits. <laughs> he misses. It's <laughs> this is the NBA. This is the NBA. I love. This is amazing. It's Yo, the Evan, shimmy. When you, when you, it's the <laughs> It's the best Evan, part. when you drop somebody, what is the pressure to make the shot? Like, oh. is it is it is it like ten times the usual? <laughs> nah, I, I mean it's just hurry up and get out your hands because I was a role player. So if I drop somebody, I'd have passed the game <laughs> or I said here somebody like. So I was like, just throwing that bad boy up. <laughs> oh, I love it. There's there's so much to love in that moment. It also is a a reintroduction for those of you who may have forgotten the, the beauty that is Marcus Smart. And it wasn't the only taste of Marcus Smart that we got last night. He also got into it a little bit with Joel Embiid. This is how we officially knew that the season had started. Who are we blaming for this, if anyone? Evan, you first. I I, I can see why <laughs> Marcus got upset. To be honest with you, his arm bent back kind of crazy. So I see why he got upset, but you know, the leg grab is pretty obnoxious. So I, I'll go with a wild card and blame uh, Jalen Brown. Let's just do that. Ooh. <laughs> okay. I like that. I like that. That's I, what I was Joel doing had, there. Joel, no foul, no technical, no nothing. But look at him, grabs his arm, yanks it. There goes elbow. How is it nothing on him? It, it was crazy to me. But I mean, it, much like James and Marcus running into each other, uh, Joel might be oh. the biggest flopper on the court yesterday. So this right here, th this was impressive. <laughs> the, the bank and the, the, that was that was some WWE stuff. I love it. It is. So, it is. Shams, did he slip or is that a genuine like soccer level flop? <laughs> I think I think both were. I mean, you you saw a Mark <laughs> Smart flop oh. from before. I think you know what Joel did there. You know, I guess momentum. You you know you never know. Mo mo momentum could definitely have been dragging him down. But I think both of those guys had had a good appearance right there. I don't really know who's to blame here. I think both guys <laughs> clearly are to blame. I guess you know with the yank of the arm and then and then kind of dragging him down. But um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just let that one be. <laughs> I'll just take it. It's all exciting. Um, all eyes on the the 34-year-old head coach of the Boston Celtics, Joe Mazzulla. He's now 1-0 in his uh, Boston Celtics head coaching career. Your thoughts, guys, last night. Did you see something from him that makes you think, all right, this could work, at least for the entire season? Eddie? Uh, one of the things I like that Boston did last night, they pushed the ball to no end. Now, I don't know if this is opponent-based and they're, hey, let's run Joel into the ground, but they pushed and pushed and pushed. Also, his, his speech after the game, Look, you're giving speeches every night. It's no big deal. Thought it was great. You give him the the, the water bottle shower. <laughs> um, you know, look, he's in good hands there. That's a strong organization. Yeah. They're going to take their time. They're going to let him get right. They're going to let him implement the things he needs to as well. A ton of vets on that team. They look great. They look prepared for all the drama they had this offseason. I thought they looked great. Is that Evan? Is that a sign? Look, we're just, I'm just a civilian, but it seems to me like the guys really dig this dude, and that that is half the battle. Is, am I reading that right? Like they like yeah, him? Of course, I think they really like him. Most importantly, they respect him. I think uh, over the past few years, just being there, Joe's been one of the first guys in the gym, day in and day out. He always works hard. He always sets the tone, and um, you know, even though he's 34, and people brag on, uh, discuss his, uh, you know, his age, his youth. He's really mature, and um, you know beyond his years so i think that's one thing he, he studies the game so much and i text him last night and said yo um good job on you know looking mature with your arms folded you look like the real thing but uh <laughs> also too great great job choosing a team that has two guys and go combine for 70 points in e any given moment you know what i mean <laughs> so uh, good place to be yeah. To piggyback off of what et said i mean i think the two things that help joe Mazzula right off the bat one is um, that he's got a group of players that respect him already. He's been there for several years now. He has the respect of his best players. He spent one-on-one -on -one time with a lot of them. 
And two, Brad Stevens. He's a he's a favorite of Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens has a lot of respect for him. It always helps when the president of your organization loves you a lot. But I think the third biggest thing for me is that the fact that he understands what he has. Like he has the leaders already in place here. It's not like he's got to overextend himself to be better than Ime Udoka. He can he can literally let his players lead and then do what he can to support them. His first day on the job, what he did was pull Al Horford and Marcus Smart aside and say, I need you guys to be the leaders of this team. And I, I'm, I'm here. Whatever you guys need from me, just let me know. And I think it takes a lot of grace for a coach to do that uh, because there are a lot, you know, Evan, I'm sure Evan's seen that are, are a little bit more hands-on and want to be more a part of uh, the action on literally a minute to minute basis. <clears throat> a micromanaging coach sounds awful. Uh, there was another <laughs> game. And it started with one heck of a long and deserved celebration. But it also gave us some more fashion. There's no way we're going to talk about Lakers and Warriors without addressing whatever this is, guys. Take it away. <laughs> the Riddler. That was, he wore Are the, the green threads still outfit. attached on the suit? It does look like it, right? He didn't rip the threads on the jacket. Oh, now, that's such a faux pas. Yeah, man. He wouldn't have done that. <laughs> He's he's a he's a tag popper, so you gotta give him. I mean, everything he's probably putting on right now, bro, is brand new. So he probably forgot to to pop the back. But other than that, I mean, he, he looks e. like Orville. Ichi, e. like <laughs> e. what kind of an event would have to happen for you to wear this suit right here? Like, what? what, what? <laughs> my last name. I mean, I'm not mad. On my last name would have to be Green, and I would have there to be winning a championship and. You know, every step I take is one step closer to the hall. So probably, you know, I'm giving great mind <laughs> and green to wear, wear whatever he wants. You know what I'm saying? So Man. I am shocked that he didn't rip the tail. Like that is one of those fashion faux pas moments that a friend should have helped him up on. But uh, the the team that they put on the floor last night, um, obviously they're back and they're ready and they're ready to do this all over again. Did you guys see any weaknesses that you could tell in this Warriors team? I know it's game one, but why not? Why not start here, guys? Eddie, do you see anything? caring enough like they, they, I mean they're a well-polished machine they've adding James Weissman to the fold and the athleticism he'll bring and they're completely minimizing what they want him to do which is fine it's like look just jump high catch some lobs we're gonna give you dunks they're so varied in everything they can do now it used to feel like maybe their size a little bit but Looney has embraced his role Draymond obviously helps there it's it's tough looking at that team and trying to pick out the hole to to you know really pick at and, and beat them they're the best team in the league for a reason agreed you guys just is there anything do you see anything evan that you'd be, be like well, maybe that could hurt them down the road no nah, i mean only thing that could hurt them down the road is injuries as we've seen in the past few years right now you know one thing that they have that we grossly undersell is culture they literally have a culture where most teams are trying to start the season trying to figure out what they have the Warriors, as of last night, seem like they're in mid-season form. So <laughs> that's, that's terrifying, uh, especially for a Lakers team that seemingly just picked up where they left off last season. Um, I think there's some passive aggression that has already been sort of spoken out loud. And we're already questioning Russell Westbrook and his role. I mean, game one, guys, what what's the deal? Like, what do we do with Russell Westbrook if you are the Lakers? I, Evan, you're smiling. <laughs> Why are you smiling? Oh, no. I mean, it's, I remember what uh, Charles Barkley said at half. So, you know, in, in Shaq combated, where, you know, Russ had 11 points at half. He's five for eight. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like He's not we're going to spotlight him. Mean, if you look for it, you're going to find it. You know what I'm saying? I'm wondering I, I, why people think this is going to be a different team. Am I missing, other than Pat Beverly, am I missing the the thing that's going to change their fate this year from last year? I think no, I, I, mean, I think it's a lot of wishful thinking. I mean, I, I'm sure Eddie will chime in here, but I think it's really wishful thinking if you think this team is going to take that next step. I I think Russell Westbrook actually played solid for most of the game. I think there were a couple mm -hmm. moments he had he had an air ball, um, you know, turn a couple turnovers that could have been avoided. Um, but I think he played at a solid level. Lonnie Walker, Kendrick Nunn, um, you know, Patrick Beverly. They just didn't get the ro any role players to really step in, and you need multiple guys to step up at, at a bunch of different levels. And they just, they, they didn't have that. And then two moments post game, Russell Westbrook saying that he really felt, he absolutely felt Darvin Ham putting him on the bench the other day to start the game contributed to his hamstring injury. And then LeBron James saying that this team doesn't have enough shooting. And this is just game one of the season.
Here we go. All right, Shams, I'm going to stick with you on this one. What can they do? How, how can they improve this roster? Well, trade is the easiest path and the most likely path and probably the path that they'll end up taking. But there's a long runway between now and the trade de deadline in February, and there's just not a trade out there. When you look at like a team like Indiana, they're set with their roster right now. There's not going to be much movement. And Indiana wants both of the Lakers' only uh, unprotected first round picks available for the rest of this decade. So y y the, the Lakers are kind of stuck right now in a, in a place where they have to keep as is. And as the year goes on, see what kind of opportunities develop, whether it's Indiana or elsewhere. Uh, but as of right now, they, they really, they, they're kind of stuck in mud a little bit. Um, guys, yeah. guys, it's been one game and I think now's a good time to overreact. It's, it's probably the best time to overreact. So just to get it started, I'd say this Lakers have no shot of making the playoffs play in nothing. So that's my overreaction slash probably perfect reaction. Um, Eddie, do you have an overreaction one game into the season here? It's actually that the Lakers will, but that's more so mm -hmm. about there's just going to be teams tanking behind. There's, there's a good five teams already in the Western conference that are going to try to tank. They'll probably see the play in, but yeah, this is, it's a, it's a bad team. They, Anthony Davis had 27 points. He looked amazing. LeBron had 32 points. He looked great after a rough first quarter. We all agree. Russ had a good game and they still got ran off the court. It, it, there was nothing they can do. You look at that roster. It's bare. Patrick Beverly had more fouls than points. It's there's a lot going on there. I'm not sure what they did this off season. They hit like three point guards. They want to play them all together. They started Russ and Pat Bev. All they really have waiting in the wings for them is Thomas Ryan, who will help. But I just don't see what they add, even the Russell Westbrook trade packages, the dream scenario of Buddy Hill and Miles Turner, hmm. that only does so much for this team. You know, if, if they end up having to do somebody for cap, as cap space, essentially for Russ, you get almost nothing back. It's tough. Unless they're going to go down the trade Anthony Davis rabbit hole, it's going to be tough Ooh. all season. That would be interesting. Guys, I want to, uh, I know we're heading to a break here, but the, uh, to me, the most important thing that happened last night was the Draymond Green documentary uh, about the punch that he gave. It is, so on our text thread last night, full disclosure, I actually thought it was a spoof video at first that somebody had edited together from, I did not, and then I watched it again. What are we giving it rating wise? And is it Oscar nominated worthy material? Shams, did you love it? <laughs> um. I thought, I thought, listen, it was an interesting situation uh, for Draymond Green to put him, uh, put himself out there like that. Um, the victim. <laughs> but, but, but listen, I, for, for weeks, I'd actually known that this was uh, something that he was going to do a documentary of, the, of training camp and preseason. Uh, so I guess, I mean, you have to add the punch incident in there somehow, some way. And I guess the, the producers played it up. Oh, did they? PR, PR mastery to say, look, Ooh. I'm a family man. Look at my beautiful daughter. Leave me alone. <laughs> Incredible it's work. Like... Incredible work. But the narration, <laughs> the music, the idea that his life has been affected more than I... Evan. It was. It was like I was worried. I thought, oh, this poor guy. I hope his hand is okay. Like that's how they got me to start feeling <laughs> as I'm watching it. Did you think this is actually a real thing that I'm watching on television right now? No, I really didn't think it was real. I was like, is he serious? Because at the end of the day, you want to fight, like. Let it go once the smoke clears. But like, like you said, like the whole thing of playing victim kind of was funny. But, you know, at the end of the day, everybody has their story. And, uh, you know, I'm a big Draymond Green fan regardless. But that was, uh, I think that's one of those things in 10 years when you look back, you're like, oh, that, that probably wasn't the best PR move, you know? That was not that was not my best work, but I appreciate that we got to see it because it was uh, it was perfect. So we only had two games last night, which can mean one thing and one thing only. We've got a thousand games tonight, and that's a good thing because we get the return of Zion Williamson. We get to find out about the Nets big three, where we are on that. And what about those Knicks? This is the year? Will they be relevant? Maybe. Were there things that you feel like I could have done this different or that different? Like what, how often do you look back at moments, even earlier in your career? The one thing I could say for myself at that time, I was, I did not understand the NBA business. I did not understand the industry that I was in, how powerful it was, how, how connected we all are. So when I asked for a trade from Cleveland, the one thing that I look back on is, you know, did I, did I exhaust as many, uh, you know, opportunities to, to get closer to guys when I felt, some type of difference. It was just a lot of uh, 
things that happened in the business that I didn't understand. You know, asking for a trade, I don't think it was my time to ask for a trade. And especially to go to Boston, who was number two in our uh, conference, or number one, this is right down the street. You know, and, and I, I just, I'm grateful that I had my time there because it was one of the, the most historical franchises that, again, I did not know the power of our industry, the Boston Celtics, the history behind it. When I reflect on it, at 30 years old, I can say I understand the business better. I understand the way that roles work. And if anybody um, you know, can, can, can sit here honestly and say like they messed up, it was me. Oh, well, very self-aware, Shams. What'd you take away from that interview? Uh, I took away that he probably regrets asking out of Cleveland in 2017 when he did, because LeBron James, obviously a year later, left. And when you look at the business of basketball, you try to maximize dollars and cents. And he was in line for another big five-year, $200 million extension with the Cavs right after that. And he decided to ask out, ends up leaving. And, you know, he's been in Boston and Brooklyn and there's been ups and downs and, and tumultuous uh, past three, four seasons. So um, I think you can always look back and play hindsight 2020. I'm sure even ET does it with his own career, but Clearly, I think that was a moment for Kyrie where he's showing some some vulnerability there. Yeah, Evan, are you watching that interview thinking, oh, I've had these thoughts to myself. I've I've looked back and tried to figure out what I did and didn't do right. Yeah, for sure. Just besides when I ask for a trade, there's no suitor. So it's, it's a different between me and Kyrie. But, <laughs> but, you know, I think one thing that he says is obviously the truth, I, I think, is um, – he didn't really comprehend the business of basketball or uh, what he was asking for. I think one thing that we take in, we forget to take into consideration is that a lot of these star players have been prodigies for forever. And when they show up and you know, show up to your organization and compete, it's not a selfish thing or anything. It's just some people don't see the bigger picture. And uh, you know what they ask for at certain moments of where they get tired, you know, they might you know, ask for something that comes off as crazy and you end up in a world, you know, whirlwind like Kyrie where, you know, you have to take a step back and realize like, okay, I made these mistakes in order to have a better tomorrow. And I think that's where he's at now because uh, that point of view and that awareness is, is everything. And I'm looking forward to seeing him play. Well, good, because we get to tonight. They're hosting the uh, the Pelicans and we're going to start with the Pelican Shams. Mm -hmm. um, it's the highly, highly anticipated return of Zion. And I think a lot of people are excited to see how this team gels together, how everything works out. As far as the dynamic between he and Ingram, what can we expect? So two years ago when Zion Williamson played, he was the man on that team. He was the all-star, the, the guy that put up historic numbers from that position. And I think Brandon Ingram kind of went into the shadows a little bit. He wasn't an all-star that year after making it in 1920. Um, but then Zion Williamson misses last year and Brandon Ingram emerges as the clear franchise face of, of this team and a guy that led them to the playoffs. And so now that Zion Williamson's back, there's definitely not, you know, personal <clears throat> issues at all with those two, but I am curious. I know people around the Pelicans are curious about the power dynamics that are going to exist between those two guys. And as they start to play again together, CJ with, with CJ McCollum for the first time as well. Well, Eddie, we mentioned earlier thinking, how, like, yeah, yeah, we ahead. mentioned earlier how delicate a balance <laughs> that is for the Celtics and for Jalen Brown to fully embrace that role and maybe even not fully, maybe begrudgingly, you know, there's been chatter mm -hmm. here and there where, you know, he's wants a little bit more of this. It, it means something to be the face of the franchise. It means something to be the center of the marquee outside the building to have the graphic on, on the network when your game is on national TV. It, it, how could it not? So yeah, you're, you're looking at that right now in new Orleans. Are those guys mature enough to say, look, we're rocking, we're a playoff team. Let's, let's just figure this out together. Or is there something that's going to happen? Is there some energy that's going to build up? Zion's the face of the Jordan brand right now. Like, he's a megastar, <laughs> number one overall pick. He's one of the biggest faces in the league in a lot of ways. Hopefully that doesn't get in the middle of them and cause anything. But, yeah, you could see it. You could see it. It's happened a million times. It's a story we've all watched happen. So, uh, yeah. I want to see them thrive. Not today. I want to see the Nets thrive tonight. But I want to see them thrive <laughs> And do well, and, and I want to see the best Zion possible. I, I think everyone does, Evan. What are you expecting from his return, and, and how this team, you know, thrives with him? Yeah, I just think simple dominance. He's a really dominant player. You know, his ball handling skill set has gotten way better. And just to try to keep him out of paint, good luck. He's literally a physical specimen. And uh, 
like it's, it's just easier said than done. And I think one thing about the NBA right now, as you can see last night, it's an arms race. So to have three great players and three great scores, I think uh, guys are going to figure out how to work it out. Especially with that culture that Willie Green's building and the players that they have, I think the chemistry and the roles are going to pick up. And it's going to be a, a long night when you face the Pelicans, for sure. So I want to, Eddie, we're starting with you because you're our resident uh, Nets expert now. But KD, Kyrie, and Simmons, this is another giant neon question mark on how is this going to look and how is it going to work? Take us through that. What's the best case scenario here? That Ben is the ultimate facilitator. He's he's aggressive on offense and finds these guys' shots. You know, last year they had to create their own shots once James was gone, and they had a ton of difficulty doing that against Boston and shot, you know, some of their worst playoff series of their careers. So even if it's two, three shots a game that Ben can, can create for them, it goes it goes such a long way. Plus on defense, Ben is probably going to be guarding Zion tonight. The toughest matchup on the floor, the most physical one, uh, that's a little, that's less taxing for, for Kevin. That's less taxing for Kyrie and everything just trickles down from there. Best case scenario, they're a title team. They're close to it. Uh, you know, but there's a lot that has to happen to get there and we got to see it happen. Yeah. From, from my perspective, I think we know what we're going to get from Kevin Durant, from Kyrie Irving. It's really the Ben Simmons as X factor. This team will go really as far as Ben Simmons and how great he looked. We saw him against Milwaukee. He was shooting floaters and hook shots. He was passing, doing everything on both ends of the floor, guarding Giannis. Like that's the Ben Simmons that this Nets team needs. Um, it's those moments where maybe he's not looking for a shot as much or really not being a force at all offensively is when this team's offense could struggle. Um, but I'm curious from Evan's perspective, how do you, after everything that's going to put all figure this out because it's, it's got to be a lot that you're, that you're dealing with. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I agree with what Eddie said earlier. I think, uh, you know, the new atmosphere for Ben is going to be great. I think if they get it to click and roll with the talent of Kyrie and, um, you know, KD, I think that, uh, you know, the next could be title contenders. And I have uh, Ben as a dark horse for finals MVP. Ooh, we're going to write that one down. We'll come back to that at the end of the yeah. season. I like it. Uh, yeah. We're going to take a quick break here when we come back. I, well, no, I think that's, that is a dark horse call. No one had that. Um, all of tonight's <laughs> biggest games, we're breaking them down. Plus, our guaranteed 100% bank shots. That means you could take it to the bank, make some cash, and you're welcome ahead of time. Uh, I feel like it's like that before every season starts in New York because we're all leaving. They're equal right now. They're in They're in the talk for championship run uh, today, but it might not last forever. We're going to take a look at some of the other big matchups for tonight. We are going to start with the New York Knicks and the Memphis Grizzlies and Jay. Jalen Brunson, all eyes on him. It was a big move for him in the offseason. Evan, starting with you, what are your expectations for what he can do there? I think he's just going to do what he's been doing, be a you know, great, great scorer. I think he's going to set the tone, um, get to the line, shoot corner threes, and, uh, you know, kill it from mid-range. Um, I think his personality, poise, and his history of winning, it will definitely be great for the culture. I definitely believe in him as a, a winner. So uh, I think that will definitely help. Yeah, I think he's in a great place to thrive. He's going to have the ball a lot. Um, he's going to have his opportunities to score how he sees fit and best works for him. You got some big pick and roll bigs over there that can help as well. Um, I, I think, you know, look, this isn't the best team in the league. I, I know the Knicks fans were sleeping well last night, but they, they got a good guy in Jalen Brunson and they're going to, they're gonna, he's going to have a, a really good season out this year, I think. Michelle, you, you talk about Knicks fans, you know, at the start of every season. I'm curious at what point in the year does the conversation go back to the Donovan Mitchell pursuit and how close they came Oof. to getting Donovan Mitchell. Quentin Grimes is a guy that's going to have a lot of eyes on him this year. How does he play tonight and the rest of the year? Because we all know that's a guy that the Knicks considered from everything I'm told as an untouchable. So uh, when at what point in the year will the conversation turn toward Knicks fans saying we wish we had that guy, Donovan Mitchell? Where is he? Well, if I know Knicks fans, uh, they'll be patient. They'll be understanding. Um, <laughs> it'll probably last the entire, they'll be fine. Uh, what about, uh, so we hope that they're better. I mean, for the sake of everyone and, and fans, but are they a playoff team? Can they make it? I know there's so much parody this season, but when you look at the up and down of the conference, do you think they have a shot, Evan, to make even the play in? I think they have a shot to make the play in. The playoffs is kind of uh that's kind of aggressive right now, but 
I like I like the idea for the play in. So Grizzlies. I like the way you put oh, it. Oh, go ahead. I like the way you put it. That's aggressive. That's aggressive. That's, for them. Aggressive. that's, that's, aggressive. that's, that's a nice way to say I'm crazy for asking that question. Uh, <laughs> for the Grizzlies on the Grizzlies side of thing, they were so much fun to watch last year. I think a lot of people sort of took notice of this young Memphis Grizzlies team. Can they pick up where they left off, Eddie? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they have one of the best young players in the league, a dark horse MVP candidate, and he's healthy. So w- they're going to go where Ja takes them and where their defense takes them. It's a strong team. They're motivated. They're, they're here to trash talk everybody. But they had a taste <laughs> of that playoffs last year, and they played the Warriors as good as any other team. And so they know they're right there. They're close. Um, you know, th- this is probably the one seed this year. Be- more so because of the Warriors have already out outwardly stated, like, look, we're going to rest our guys all year, basically. Uh, only Steph Curry played 30 minutes last night. Everybody else, it helped that they were blowing the Lakers out. But the, the Grizzlies are going to play hard all year. They're going to want Did you the say one, seed, one so. seed, though? The one seed. I think they, wow. can, I think they can win 60 games. Right. I mean, write look, that down. We, we see these teams every year who, who kind of just try harder in the regular season than other teams. That's the Grizzlies, hmm. the young guys talking trash and who play physical. I, I see that. I could see them being the one seed for sure. I think, I think I, if I'm the Grizz, I actually take a page out of the Warriors books because we've seen John ja Morant and, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. is still coming back from injury. But John ja Morant specifically, there's always going to be a play because he plays with such reckless abandon. That's what makes him so beautiful to watch. But I think for them, uh, I, I would probably take a page out of the Warriors books in, in that term. But I'm curious long term with this organization. They've, they've <laughs> got a stockpile of young players. They've got five first round draft picks they can use. At what point do they cash their chips in? Do they keep building organic? They have all their guys signed long term to contracts. So um, I I think this Grizzlies runway is going to be for at least the next decade. But we'll see when they want to cash their chips in and try to go get another star with John Morant. I like that. We're going to switch over to a Cavs Raptors, Evan, starting with you. They got Donovan Mitchell. That was another big um, thing that happened in the offseason. Is he enough to push them forward into the next realm, for lack of a better word? Can they go far with him? No, I think he's enough to keep the momentum going, but, you know, contenders is, is a bit much in that sense, considering, you know, how they ended last year. You know, we just got to see Donovan win more in playoff situations. I'm a big Donovan Mitchell fan. I think he's, he's really good. But to really get, make a trade and put him as a contender, I don't think Donovan has a show enough to make that a serious conversation. Yeah, I Eddie, agree. agree? It's, it's, yeah. I, I agree. It's, it's going to... I want to see the fit next to Garland. It's it's always interesting to see two dominant ball handlers like that, and they both like to have the ball to do the things they do and break down off the dribble. Um, you know, we have to see how they look defensively. Like, yes, they have that gigantic front line with Mobley, uh, but yeah, they got smaller in the guard position at the point of attack, and that's going to matter a ton in the playoffs. And and even as the season goes on, they're still figuring out the small forward position. We're gonna have to see how their defense shapes up. It's a lot to put on Mobley and the big fella in the middle. Uh, so we'll see. I, I love Donovan. He's hot and cold. Uh, you know, he's going to have to be more consistent. Eddie, they've got two guys making 200, almost $200 million, but the guy that I'm focused on more is Evan Mobley. I think he's got the potential. Like their ceiling could be exponentially greater if he steps up this year and takes another step in his career. So it's crazy to think that two guys making two hundred million dollars, and I'm looking at the guy that's still on his rookie deal that could be the difference maker for this team. I'm, I'm curious agent to know. Likes that. <laughs> I, I'm curious to know what you think of Mobley Etz. Just as a player, he's a little limited on offense. He's obviously extremely versatile on defense. Curious to know how you see him as a prospect going yeah. forward. I think he's really good. I think obviously um, he, he, his skill set's good. He shows a lot of potential. I think uh, all the the news and stuff that comes from there shows that he's a worker. I think he's still a few years off because to call him a contender, Mobley has to be at like an AD level right now. So if that's the level we're trying to show at. I still think he's three or four more years away. But like you said, I like uh, I'm more intrigued by Mobley and, and and how Garland are developing. And, you know, how, uh, how Donovan can, you know, blend into that will, will definitely help and now now cause and set the tone for the year. On the Toronto, Toronto side of things, Scotty Barnes obviously introduced himself mm-hmm. to the league last year in a very successful way. Does he have the ceiling to become a superstar in this league, Evan? I mean, if Giannis is a superstar, I don't see why not. 
I think uh, they have the same skill set. I think they have similar motor, and I think his uh, mentality is the right type of mentality. And, um, you know, one thing that he has is the opportunity to show a skill set and get better. I think that's the number one thing in the league is what organization will be patient with you in order to develop into a superstar. And you see Toronto has had a history to allow that with DeMar DeRozan and, uh, you know, other players in the past. I feel like with much like with Mobley, it's real easy to see and project them against these guys who came in the league scoring 18, 20 points a game. It's hard to develop into that scorer who can get those 10 buckets a night, who can get them in varied ways, who can create offense in those ways. Scotty looks great. He's a, he's a creator on offense. Is he going to be a jump shooter at some point in his career? That's not a given. That's, that's a tough skill to learn on the fly, uh, you know, throw you right into the fire. I love what he does on the court. I love how that sets them up going into the future. Um, superstar potential for sure, but I would hate to say it's a given that he just gets there. I mean, I, I saw his quote, I think on media day, he said that he feels he's a point guard. So when you look at a guy like him at six, nine, six, 10, still growing, probably like to be able to play the one through the five, essentially in the league right now, I want to see him at the point. I know they've got Fred Van Bleet, but I want to see how Scotty Barnes plays more at the one, two and three this year and can really play every position guard, every position. So yeah, that type of player has superstar potential. Moving over to Dallas, guys. They got no Jalen Brunson, but Hardaway Jr. Is this the year for him to just take over, to show what he can do? Timmy's got to stay healthy. That's the problem. He, he he can score. He's in a good position next to Luka as well to create secondary offense, to, to get it off the catch and attack people that are closing out. But he has to stay healthy. It was, it, it, they really could have used him in that Warriors series last year because when he's right, He's a bucket and he can defend. He's active defender as well. And they're going to need him. Um, is there a leap for him? I, I, I don't know, but he's in a good situation to thrive. He's in a great role in the team he's on. Evan, you agree? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big Tim Hardaway fan. Uh, obviously, I'm an even bigger, bigger Luca Doncic fan. So I probably like Tim better, you know, even more because he's next to Luca. Um, you know, I think, you know, year 10 coming into the league, saying if he can take over and thrive. I'm not really, I haven't been waiting for that you know, much more than I would have the first three or four years. But I'm looking forward to uh, Hardy stepping up and a couple of other players as well, Christian Wood and those guys. But, you know, any team of Luka is going to be okay. I've got my eye on Spencer Dinwiddie because he's a guy that's going to essentially replace Jalen Brunson as a starting two guard next to Luka Doncic. He's going to be able to run the offense when, when Luka Doncic goes to the bench at a different point. So he's got to really have a, a big year. And I know his relationship with Jason Kidd, he's got relationships throughout that staff that will help him as well. But um, this is the role that I think he's probably seen for himself all summer is starting next to Luka Doncic. And he has that starting tonight. On the Phoenix side of things, they, they find themselves in such a bizarre situation with everything that happens uh, in the off season, And now they're expected to sort of repeat the success they've had. But the entire league has seemingly gotten better. So, Evan, can they do they have what it takes to repeat what they've been able to do the last couple? Yeah, I, I think they definitely do. Obviously, when you have a turnover of uh, the roster of your main guys, you're definitely going to have that advantage. I think one thing that they have to do is really prove that they're no longer like a regular season, you know, regular season Kings and really get over the hump and get back to the championship and try to win it. Cause I think that's the level. I think that's the level they've been talking at and the trash talk they've been given. So it's no longer if they can win 60 something games to be one of the best teams. Now it's not giving up a lead and making it to the finals. Like you've been, like you've been talking about. I, I agree with Evan. Like they're going to be a strong regular season team for sure. As long as Chris, and Devin Booker are healthy, and Michael Bridges continues to elevate. Yeah, they're going to win a lot of games this, this season. We've said it over and over again. There's a lot of teams that are going to be trying to lose. There's a lot of bad teams, a lot of teams that want to be bad. They're going to win a ton of games. They have to win in the playoffs. That's, that's all it, that it comes down to for them. And this might be one of those sneaky teams where the, the regime may be threatened this year because if they don't get it done in the playoffs this year, Chris Paul's a year older. He's, he's mm -hmm. only have a, a year left on his contract after that. You got to look at Monty Williams. Like, hey, are you going to get us over the hump? DeAndre Ayton has already said he wants out pretty vocally. Jay Crowder wants out. He's sitting out now. Uh, they're they're going to have to really reconsider what they do in the future if things don't go well this year. Dysfunction. Shams, I know you've got a whole world to go conquer. Thank you so much. We will see you on Monday. Uh, and guys, you're sticking around because we are going to help you help us help you make a bunch of money 
on tonight's games. Stick around. This is Run It Back. FanDuel Sportsbook has a great offer for new customers. Bet five bucks right now and get $150 in free bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers get three months of NBA League Pass with a $5 bet. Make every moment more with FanDuel. So we've spent some time today breaking down the games that are coming up tonight, but now it's time to put put your money <laughs> where your mouth is. And we're going to start with Detroit and Orlando. It's the battle of the number ones. Um, and the Pistons in this one favored by three. Who you guys got, Eddie? I got the Pistons. I think they're a sneaky team that's going to win a lot of games this year and push for the playoffs. They're actually built to uh, splash a big trade as well. So I got them coming out strong. I got them winning tonight. Yeah, me too. I agree with Eddie. I for sure, yeah, I for sure have them winning tonight. Thousand percent. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. That was an easy one. That was just we're just easing in. Pelicans Nets. We talked a little bit about uh, Brooklyn favored by two and a half. First, who do you have? I'm, Eddie, I know you have Brooklyn. Why am I even asking? Is that, is yeah, that I, got, I got Brooklyn. I got the, I got the home team. Let's put that one down. <laughs> and yeah, then you too? I, yeah, I too have Brooklyn. I, I, I like the matchup, the big three. I like them. All right, but then how about Kevin Durant? It's the over-unders, 27 and a half points. What are we taking? Eddie? I'm going over. This is the team he got hurt against. I'm getting a little bit of Herb Jones uh, revenge. I'm going to say Kevin pushes to towards 35, hopefully. Okay, okay. Uh, what? Yeah, I, I gotta agree. That's that's twenty seven. Doesn't he average thirty two for a career or something? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, well, okay, fine. Kevin Durant, I think, is one thing we know who he is, but Ben Simmons is set at nine and a half points over or under. That one's interesting, Eddie. Are you taking the over on that as well? I'm gonna go under, but I think he's gonna have a good game. I think he's gonna have okay. a good, very game. I'll say that. All right, I'm gonna go Great. over. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go okay. over for it. I'm writing this down as if somehow I'm taking your money and putting it for you. That's weird. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm doing that. Uh, Knicks Memphis, the Grizzlies favored by five and a half in that one. Ja Morant, he's set at 29 and a half points. Over under on that. Fun. Evan, just you under. On that one. Oh, under? Just, just, just barely. Under. I mean, he gets like 28 tonight. What do you Probably think, Evan? Line. Yeah. yeah. I, opening night, man, Ja, he's a performer, a showman. I, th- I think he's going to get 30. I think he's going to go. 35. By the way, that, that line moved to four points. Something's going on. Yeah, it's going to be, wow, that's going to be really fun on that one. Jalen Brunson, we all get to see him for the first time for reels. Over under on 18 and a half for him. Evan? I got under. That's really? Okay. I got, I got over. over He's going to have the ball all game. He's going to shoot, shoot, like, shoot 25 right? times. I feel like he has to have the over or else what are we doing here? Uh, Cavs, Raptors, <laughs> Raptors. And now I know because I just, I, I, don't, I don't know, I'd be weirded out. Two and a half points. That's what the Raptors are favored by. Yes to that. Toronto for the win. I got Cleveland winning outright. Hmm. Okay. I think it's a better team. Thinking about it. I was thinking about it. <sighs> I'll, I'll give it to, uh, <laughs> I, think I, got, I think I got Toronto. Okay. Or well, looking at scoring again, okay. Donovan Mitchell. Will he have? Over 30 points. That's a big one, Evan. No, I don't see Donovan having <laughs> over 30. <now. laughs> All right, under. Yeah, I'm with Evan too. I, I don't see it next to Darius. Not 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 just yet. They still gotta figure that's that a out. A lot of it's a lot of points. Yeah, I don't want to watch a game where Donovan has 30. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's what we're really yeah, saying here. We, yeah, that, that's not that what we're 30, interested in. He's getting to 30 for sure. That's a lot. That yeah. Okay. What about Siakam? They have him at 22 and a half. Is that doable? That's going to be tough with Evan. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and with Jared Allen in the middle, that's going to be tough. I, yeah. I'm going to say under. I'm going to go under. Yeah, I'm, I'm going under as well, for sure. All right. So, Evan, if you could just Venmo me whatever monies that you want me to put down on all of these debts, that would be great. <laughs> and we appreciate right. you joining us today. It's been fun. This has been a great first week for us. We'll see you guys back on Monday. Right back, yeah.